Yeah, okay, folks, right. Well, what I want to talk, talk about today, not too, well, it shouldn't take too long, is a kind of a continuation of what we talked a little bit about during the uh, workshops last week. It's really focusing your ideas on your research for both your infographic poster and then that should lead on into your article that you'll be writing. And so we talked a little bit about the front end of the question and then we'll talk today a little bit more about the back end of the question. So if you're registered on Information Security and Assurance, C6508, then the focus within the major question of big data driven analytics decision making is all about questions to do with ethics of trust, governance, security, audit, and provenance. And that really covered you guys for certain. And I think almost everybody from VSCIT, pretty much everybody, is looking at ES, but there may be one or two of you doing ISA as well, but, so it doesn't really matter, but you're looking at the opportunities, the challenges, benefits and operations that come out of looking at big data and analytics driven decision making. So two different sorts of focus, which will lead you probably in different directions. And with a little bit of luck, we should end up with a different focus topic from every single one of you. That has a benefit for me, I don't get bored, because I don't get the same uh, essay, the same article. It also means that you can focus it yourselves on something that really, really interests you individually. Now, this is last year, the SME one. It's probably still interesting to focus on SMEs, because many of you are going to work for smaller companies. Um, but then there are some things that you're going to come up with, may, some of you may come up with, which actually look at bigger organisations or into research organisations. So it doesn't matter where your sector is, whatever you want to look at, <coughs> but it has to be big data. And previous groups, so the last couple of years, have been looking at what were the traditional five, four Vs of big data. In fact, it started off back in about 2002 with three Vs. Uh, which actually kind of define V for velocity, V for volume, and V for variety. But over the last couple of years, we've come up with a whole lot more V words which don't define big data, but they help you to ask interesting questions about the nature of the data you want to use for this analytics that then drive decision making. And at least all sorts of those, those what, well, six, 10 different questions um, that are built into the topics. Now the V's for, the V for volume was really quite um, definitional. It really relates to amount of, amounts of data which the technology we have around us today, or back in 2001, we didn't have the technologies that really helped us to actually uh, manipulate it effectively. Um, the, the velocity one is that sometimes it's streaming in from sensor networks or from Twitter, for example, at rates which is quite tricky to handle. And that's led to interesting developments over the last three, four years um, from the Apache type of environment, the Apache Hadoop, as a database mechanism coming from Google, and then which helped handle huge volumes. And then they came up with the Apache Spark, which is the sort of an underlying piece of software or operating system capability. <clears throat> which handle, allows you to handle enormous volumes coming very, very fast. And you'll find that in a lot of the co big conferences around big data and analytics are now concentrating very, very much, particularly into Spark. Two years ago, it was Hadoop was a great thing. Now it's just Hadoop and Spark. But there are all sorts of other technologies which come into it governed by those two Vs, plus another very important one, the variety V, which again define, helps to define big data, is that we are getting data in all sorts of formats and structures and unstructured. Because if you go back to kind of around about 2000, yeah, we had quite large quantities of data and big companies, like Rolls Royce across the, the, the Cup City or British Rail. Um, 
pharmaceuticals companies, they had huge, huge volumes of data, but it's all pretty well structured. Nice relational databases. But now we're using more and more and more text uh, data. We're using multimedia as well, uh, audio, video, and photographic. And these come in all sorts of structures or no structure at all. And that's driving some of the interesting questions about how do we actually analyze the stuff. And then there's another set, a whole lot of other Vs which we'll have a look at in a minute, which help you to ask interesting questions. And this is particularly important for companies using big data. They need to think about the question of governance. How can they do the right things with the right, in the right way, with the right attitude and approach? And you can keep adding the right something as long as you like. Um, right quality, perhaps. And if we think of, and when we look at them, we'll have pose one or two interesting questions. So, first of all, what's the target sector? Are you going to go for an industry sector, or are you going to a particular type of business within what, an industry sector? Or are you going to look at something completely different? Up to you. It must relate to big data, and that will lead you then ultimately to the topic, that narrow little topic that you're going to write about, you're going to research about for your poster. And to do the poster, because it's an infographic poster, you need some data, some statistics. If we look at whether it's SMEs or big, bigger organisations, <coughs> there are various sorts of organisations that you might be interested in. People who produce the software, the analytics software, ways of analysing data, ways that produce the tools that you use for evaluating what's going on in the data that you've captured if you're doing forensics or if you're doing that analytics to help drive decision making uh, in big data analytics is different from operations research in the sense that big data analytics is all about embedding an attitude within the organisation to using this huge amount of data productively for the benefit of the company and the customers and other stakeholders. Whereas OR is very much focused, tends to be focused on individual small projects or big projects but which need an answer and then you move on. And so there's lots of different tool sets coming out there. Lots of different organisations using big data. There's a lot of work going on at the high levels of big companies. Much less going on with this, the smaller retail organisations who everybody says, you can gain an enormous amount from using big data. And they're kind of a bit sceptical. Or else, that's a big problem for SMEs, they don't have permanent IT or analytics staff. They aren't big enough. You know, if they've got 20 people in the company, uh, they're not going to be able to afford to pay 30, 35, 45,000 a year for a good analytics expert. So they need to find ways of getting help. Which leads on to consultants. And some of you guys in the um, CFI, one or two of you are already working for um, forensics type organisations. You're a consultant to the end users, perhaps. If you're on the ISA, on the enterprise system side, then you might be thinking about setting up an analytics um, business, say in the town centre here, to support some of the SMEs, the retailers, and other people who can use some of that fabulous data that's out there, whether it's in Twitter, whether it's in social media, or whatever, or just using the data that their accountant uh, captures through their till rolls and so on and the invoices, etc. All sorts of ways of pulling data together to help drive value for an organisation. So maybe you think about the top end, maybe you think about a particular focus. This is just one way of looking at it. There's all sorts of other ways, but I'm just giving you sort of an example to help you get started. The V's of big data. The three definitional, definitional ones which came from places like IBM and Gartner. And then 
we got a few extra added in by the industry between 2003 and about 2006 uh, or 7. And these are ones like <coughs> variability. That's relating to the question about, well, how does the value, do the values of the data change in a particular situation? And it could be that right, you're linking to the weather data. So you know it's highly structured, temperatures and pressures and wind speeds and directions and humidity and so on. But how does that change minute to minute, hour by hour, day to day, week to week and so on? Or it could be related to, if you're using social media, do any of us have a perfectly fixed attitude? So that we will always respond exactly the same way to tweets or to postings and so on. Or do we actually get out of bed on the wrong side one day and suddenly we reverse our preferences? So if you're thinking about analysing social media and tweets and such like, just because I said I love this particular thing, it might be a, a restaurant, it might be a piece of hardware that I just bought for my PC or something, or anywhere in that range. Or it could be a new gadget you've got, you know, maybe new uh, antiperspirant or uh, face makeup, whatever. Is the opinion that I post today likely to change tomorrow, next week, next month? So that's variability. Because if you try and make business decisions about people's preferences, if you're not careful, you will assume that the ones you've captured are the ones that are going to be there for all time. Even if you don't know who has actually, because it's all anonymized, you don't know who made those decisions, but in aggregate, we've got 25% <coughs> who love it, 25% who hate it, and the middle 50% who couldn't care less. But that 25%, and they've got these characteristics, so we can always send our marketing and advertising out to them. How do we know, or do we know, that that's going to be permanent, that we can keep sending that stuff out, or will it change? So there's lots of things come out of this variability question, the value. That came from IBM, as one of the critical things they came up with, meaning it's great doing analysis of data, storing it, investing in these huge infrastructures to capture and do things with big data, but what's its purpose? And they're making the point. The only purpose of capturing and analysing and doing things with this big data is to actually add value to your organisation, add value to your customers. But that then poses some rather interesting questions. What do we mean by the word value? Is it pound notes? Might be. For who? Is it pound notes in me, the supplier's um, pocket? Better profit margins, better cash flow perhaps? Or is it better value in some other fashion for the user? So if we think about value in relation to, say, autonomous cars, what's the value going to be self-driving cars? I can jump in, I feed in some code that says where I want to get to, and it gets me there. What on earth is the real value of that? Is it just value to Google that they've got another product that they can start selling in large quantities? Or is it value for me, the customer who's going to rent these things or hire them or something? V for veracity, truthfulness. John Easton said in 2012 in a presentation, 80% of all the data we now have around us is of uncertain veracity. Not saying it's all wrong or all telling lies, but we have a problem. We don't know for certain whether a piece, one single data point is true false, accurate or inaccurate, or even by how much it's accurate or inaccurate. And when I first came across this presentation two years ago, I thought, oh, that's easy, yeah. It fits with um, the, all that new stuff, the new multimedia and Twitter and Facebook and social media stuff. 
because down the bottom was a sort of 10%. 15%, which was the old traditional structured databases for ERP systems and finance systems and so on, stuff we've been working with for 40 odd years. And then I thought a bit more, and one of our students, um, I think she was a first year student last year or maybe the year before, pointed out that actually, even in our core operational systems like our ERP systems, we don't necessarily cannot necessarily trust all of that data. Big organizations using ERP systems discover that within a year of getting implementing a new ERP system, and before they implement it, they will have cleaned up all the data from their legacy system before they import it into the new one, so they start off with a clean-ish sort of set of data. Within about three to four years, they need to start data cleansing all over again. And one of the reasons for that is that modern systems are always less capable in terms of what it, they can do than what the world needs, the customers need from that system. Because we can't afford to implement 100% systems. And so people then, because they have to, meet the, have to meet the needs of the customer, they somehow have to shoehorn the data of the decisions, the orders and so on into the system to record what they've done. So they invent interesting codes for special cases. And in one of the sets of data we've just acquired from for location services, there's a magical code minus 777 in the altitude column, which means no data or it wasn't working. Minus anything else is valid, apparently. Minus 777 is a special code for saying it broke. And you get that in all sorts of things. And so, veracity. How truthful is the data? How, how accurate is the data? And can we identify data which isn't accurate? And can we identify by how much it is inaccurate? Because that, again, can affect decision making. And if you're thinking of something like um, Internet of Things, sensor networks. Uh, and you put out, put across the whole of Derby, little sensors which you can buy quite cheaply that measure air pressure, say, or pollution levels, so air quality. Those sensors, depending whether you buy an expensive one or a cheap one, lose accuracy over a time period of between a couple of weeks and a couple of months, or a bit longer. How can you detect how each sensor is changing? And I don't know whether you saw in the newspapers a few months ago complaints about air quality in Derby and coming down the Burton Road at the traffic lights at the bottom where Abbey Street starts, there's a little grey box about that high, that sort of size, with a pipe at the top. And that's an air quality measure. And there was a problem about, we all know about nitrous oxides coming from petrol driven cars and uh, diesel cars. And that one there, at the bottom, had one of the highest levels of nitrous oxides or nitrogen oxides anywhere around. And there's a school 40 feet up the hill and about 50 yards from the edge of the cliff. And so everyone said, oh, this is absolutely disaster, this is terrible. There's a school within a short distance of the highest concentration of nitrous oxides from um, buses and so on and diesels uh, in the country almost. That one probably is relatively accurate, it's a fairly big piece of machinery and it's pretty well maintained. But if we just had a whole host of little IoT devices, how would we know when that had drifted in its calibration? If it switches off, we can tell dead easy, it's not generating data. But if it's producing something and it's, you know, from day to day, it's going to be fairly consistent. It'll probably still have the um, wavy line of uh, levels because of the traffic in the rush hour, in the morning, in the evening, and so on. But we might not detect for a while that it's getting more or less as the calibration drifts. So how do we make sensible decisions of things which are of uncertain veracity? And validity. How well does it apply? Is it actually the right thing? Think of the word valid. Um, 
We also came up then, our group, <coughs> with these four extra ones to try to give you some ideas of other questions about all of this data. Volatility is kind of like variability, but it's to, more to do with the data just expires. It's just not any, no longer valid at all. And you could think of a salt pan, for example, where the water just evaporates and just leaves salt at the bottom of it eventually. And so, in a similar sort of sense, how good is our data? Is it captured permanently or does it just expire? And if you think about things like flash drive memories, sometimes the data cannot be rewritten or it becomes, that little cell dies within the within the memory chip. So there's all sorts of things, again, you can bring in there. Verbosity, too many words, lots of words. Does that give it, does words give us a problem? Can we actually process um, text-based information and get sensible answers out of it? And you guys were, you had a look at or shown how we could get with um, Ivan Bluemix and Watson, we can use data from Twitter in large quantities. But organisations who are using social media and Twitter to capture customer perceptions have to struggle with a whole range of exciting question, problems, like irony. We can tell that someone's being ironic by the voice or by their face. But you can't necessarily read it in ordinary text. You can't be sure whether they're being positive, yeah, I love that, or yeah. Things like that. You also, Twitter particularly, whilst it still stays at 140 characters, although they're ga I gather they're changing that fairly shortly, in 140 characters, people don't write grammatically or perfect English or other languages, nor do they follow the syntax and grammar. How can you work out reliably what those Twitters really mean? So that's kind of a question that comes from that. Vulnerability drives straight into the questions um, for ISA, particularly the um, security and such like. Because a lot of the big data and associated aspects of big data and IoT lead to some really nasty vulnerabilities, maybe on the purely security side, but also in terms of reputational vulnerability. And if you think about what happened with Talk Talk uh, last year, where their big data environment, or relatively big data environment, got hacked, that doesn't do their reputation any good. In fact, they lost, I forget, about half, I think it was about half a million customers or more. It cost, they reckon their cost of that big break in was something of the order of 70 million quid in terms of lost business people moving away from talk talk to other internet providers and so on. Or if you look at a really interesting example uh, from about three or four years ago, a big supermarket in the USA called Target, they were the ones who were able to found a way of predicting whether women were pregnant and then targeting them with advertising. They found that that had a huge reputational hit because people thought, now this is beyond the pale, it's beyond the ethics, uh, it's bad governance, it's damaged your credibility, you really shouldn't have done those sort of things. Which leads a bit up towards the question, are the questions we sh should not ask our big data because to use it is going to be bad for our companies or bad for our customers and however you like to define the word ethics. And verification comes back again to veracity and validity. Is that how do you make sure that what's going on is right? So verification is verifying the data is correct and valid, but also verifying the software you're using, the tools you're using, do are they capable of generating repeatable uh, answers? So what I'm aiming for you to use is those various Vs. And I'll put some other ones up in the, um, I'll show you where you can find some other questions of the other Vs. Can you use those Vs to help you narrow down to a particularly 
interesting topic for your work. So the question then comes, what's the title of your project? Because what, we, what I'd like you to do, because this kind of helps you not to waste effort, focus in at the moment on a topic where you can go get data to produce your infographic poster for, that then leads on to helping you to write the article. So you could almost think of your infographic poster as a pictorial abstract to grab the attention of the readers of the uh, ebook we're going to produce. So they'll go and look at your article. So the infographic poster, think of it as the abstract in a graphical sense with data, with statistics that captures the reader's attention and like a good abstract sells your article, convinces the reader that yeah I'm going to invest some time reading that article as opposed to maybe that article. Going back to last week, so what is the specific purpose statement and what do you want to achieve? Are you just going to be informative or are you going to try and be persuasive? And bear in mind in terms of the uh, way that we work in universities, that kind of descriptive, which is kind of first year potentially, whereas that one, critical analysis and so on, kind of sit uh, third year. So you may well want to ensure that you aim for that. You're going to persuade someone that this is something they didn't know that they didn't know, but it's really important they understand and then do something about. Those are that sort of one. It's actually the most effective way of using this module. It will get you the highest marks. And it will be most valuable when put up on the web and people out there start reading it. Oops. And this is the final slide. So taking all that into account, Hopefully you kind of narrowed into a topic area. You know what you're trying to do. So what data are you going to need to capture? What statistics are you going to need to capture to be able to produce a really great infographic poster and then lead you into a really well-researched journal article? And then how do those V's help you really get a focus? That's what it's all about. Okay, that's the end of this, this part of it.